What's his name? Uh, I want to say podcast. Clifford. Little Clifford. Good job, Ben. So that was that was the quote you used last time as well, right? I can't, I know. I think What's your favorite quote. No, I think the one I used last time was when he's like, "Look like a human boy." Right, so you're doing right. it again, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So I I switched it up this time. Um, this you know this is a position we we don't often find ourselves in, if ever, which is uh, taking a second bite at the same apple. Uh, circling back around to a movie we previously covered. And not only that, uh, a movie we previously covered on main feed, doing it again on main feed. But this is a special day. Uh, last time we talked about this movie, it was Ben's choice. Correct. That's why Ben started off, kicked things off with the quote. That is not the case this time. No. Now, we don't think of ourselves as a podcast where we uh, uh, auction off control of the feed for charity. <laughs> That is not something we advertise. We're not one of these uh, highfalutin, uh, I don't know, dilettante balls where you're auctioning off dinner dates and, and shit like that. Right. We're, we're, we're parading our meat, you know, in, in tuxedos. Yes. Hitting, you know, like, you know, old ladies with pearls are, are, are bidding for dinner with us or whatever. Right. We're not, we're not given the walk-on appearances as raffle prizes, but... <laughs> But last last summer, in in the midst in the in the peak of the pandemic, uh, I was doing the uh, the George Lucas talk show uh, every week, and uh, we were we were trying week after week to raise as much money as we could for different charities and causes and orgs and what have you. And uh, one man uh, single handedly kind of raised the bar for our fundraising with what has uh, since been deemed his uh, antagonistic philanthropy uh, in that he would uh, come into the chat waving around a big figure in exchange for uh, forcing us to do something. Uh, maybe you don't want to do. Right. Things that were, were pre not even on the table before. Right. <laughs> such as uh, throwing an entire pastrami sandwich out the window when I hadn't eaten in six hours. Um but at, at one of the uh, weeks, uh, this, this man came in on a phone call. He placed a phone call to Watto and live on air negotiated the terms of a donation, I think, to hit, hit whatever goal we were trying to hit that week, which was main feed second Clifford episode. And so uh, that that is what we are doing today. It took a while to fulfill. Uh, you know, I had major surgery. Uh, mm -hmm. David and his wife welcomed their first child, and Ben rode a dang horse. So Correct. there were three yeah. major so big, things that delayed. Big things going on. Right. The yeah. recording of this episode. But it, but it just so happens that things have timed out so perfectly because in addition to being the host of uh, a Double Threat, and the best show. Our guest today also is the author of the newly released book, It Never Ends, ladies and gentlemen, uh, here, uh, not by demand, but by donation, uh, Tom Sharpling, our guest on Clifford 2, Hyper Clifford. Oh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I'm sorry that I basically paid my way in like somebody bidding on a charity auction to be like a, to have a walk on. <laughs> on an episode of a sitcom. Hey, um, but those are always the best performances. I mean, I don't know about you, but I could always tell when someone was really popping on a sitcom, it was because they donated a lot of money for that that two-line role. America's Next Top Model used to get to like be in an episode of Veronica Mars if yes. you won like the weekly challenge. And right, they would always kill it playing right. like mm -hmm. the person who's like, oh, the boss, yeah, he's right in there, you know, behind the desk. I, I read just yesterday that Glenn uh, Heady did that with uh, Glenn Headley rather did that with uh, the X Files movie. Oh, really? She just was like, wait, she paid her way in. Yeah, she's a non-speaking like walk on in that movie, and she donated. And give her a real role. She's a good yeah. actress. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, that's that's troubling. I mean, they should have cast her, but but uh, yes, I mean, it, it, Tom, look. Uh, did did you force our hand for this episode? Yes. <laughs> Are we happy to do it anyway? Yes, absolutely. Always. Long I overdue. That's that's what matters. Yes. Is that we're yes. all here. What matters is we're all here. We're all healthy. Yes. And we're all 
celebrating the movie Clifford far past the point of discussion with it. Somehow we are still talking about it. Yes. Now, can you talk about your history with this movie? Uh, recently, Charles Grodin passed. And uh, on Double right. Threat, you did a, a Charles Grodin tribute episode with Martin Short. Yeah. Uh, but I know this is a movie that, that's that been a favorite of yours that you bring up a lot that has been a, a, a long running part of your comedic sensibility. Yeah, it was it was one of those movies that uh, I always loved. Martin Short, SCTV is one of my all time favorite things, and I loved watching him become Martin Short the movie star and and on SNL and all of that. And I love Charles Grodin. And then, so there's this movie that it's Martin short getting to be like the most Martin short Martin short could possibly be in, in a film career where things were kind of capturing elements of what made me love Martin short. Here's a movie that was just like, we're just letting him do the thing he does. And Charles Grodin, it's the same thing for him. He gets to be just this really kind of crappy version of himself the way he is on talk shows or in Heartbreak Kid. He's he's not a great guy in this. He's not yet, he's not in full Beethoven dad mode and that he's, and it kind of puts these two giants together. And I've always loved it. And it's a movie that John Worcester and I bonded over when we first met. It was one of the things that when we had that in common, we're just like, well, I think we're, um, we're meant to, to know each other. And then our friendship grew from it. And it's been something that has just meant a lot over the years. And I've pulled multiple quotes from it for best show. John and I have, and run with, I want to say Mason and, just it's just a very meaningful movie because it's also just so weird and it's such a turnoff to so many people too when they're just like wait that movie and they're just like that seems like it's terrible right and you're just like well it you could say it's terrible like i if somebody was just like i hate it it's terrible i'd be like i kind of can't argue with you (laughs) about i can't i can't it's not like it's not like when somebody doesn't like a Paul Thomas Anderson movie, and they're just like, that movie sucked. And it's just like, well, maybe the movie didn't suck. Maybe you didn't like it, but it's like, it's not garbage. But like this, somebody could go make a case against it, but I could make a case for it. I, I mean, I think that so much of this movie's uh, legacy is that uh, people either love it or it kind of like upsets them on a cellular level. People are just kind of like immediately revulsed by it from the word go. I think a lot of that is just the odd uncanny nature of Martin Short being a little boy and no one treating him any differently than any other child in the movie, which weirdly has now come back around and is like a very prevalent thing. Like you have two critically adored TV shows in which adult women play young children alongside a cast of other children. Wait, what's the yes. pen 15? What's the other one? And the, the Nassim Pedrad one, Chad. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah. It, it's just funny that like Clifford on its face, people were like, nope, absolutely not. Cannot put an adult next to kids dressed up like a little kid makes me uncomfortable. And, yeah. you know, there might be a difference between male actors and female actors doing that and what have you. But it is interesting that both of those shows are very well liked now. Chris Gethard and I years ago were pitching and we had IFC. We were working on an adaptation of his book to right. be a series. And that was going to be the device of that. And that we were doing yeah. that like seven years ago. He would play right. would himself like at every Chris, Chris has a teen or whatever. Right. And Chris, just, Chris would, right. yes, he would have acted against whatever age group the story uh, took place in. And it would have been like Chris and, a, and other and Chris and a bunch of eight year olds running from a 10 year old. <laughs> would have been the funniest, like a 10 year old bully. And it haunts me that that never got filmed. That would have been the funniest thing I've ever seen. Chris getting bullied by an actual child. 
he's ideal for that. I feel like that, that there is a, not like like Grodin couldn't do this, right? Obviously, no. like you know, Martin Short is one of the few. Mm-hmm. Look, we we did this episode four years ago. Ben picked this movie. This is a movie that I had never seen. Um, I had a roommate who was a huge fan of the movie to the extent that they named their, the family named their dog Clifford out of their shared love for the movie and then had to deal with the fact that then there was a famous dog, fictional dog named Clifford that emerged later. Um, And I think I, I don't remember the episode very well, Griff, but you can probably, I I think I was incredibly unsettled by Martin Short. Well, I had a chance to quickly review it, and uh, right, I just a pulled a bit. couple okay. of quotes here of the, that okay. David had said in the last episode. Well, okay. this movie is okay. sick. <laughs> sure. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, also said, I'm rooting for Grodin. I'm sorry. I'm rooting for Grodin. I want him to kill this kid and get away <laughs> with it. That's what I yeah, want man. to happen. It's because I, gonna... I want him to build that transit system. Right. I think I was kind of... Weirdly, especially at the time, I, I do I do love transit infrastructure. I think I was very yes. sad for his dream you being love, imploded. You love trains. Right? You love infrastructure. Yeah, you like you hate sure. chaos, and you don't like yeah. theme parks. Don't like theme parks. Don't like. But I do think I I had this general. I was so unsettled by the movie, and I was impressed by how unsettling the movie was for me. Like it's not like I was like, well, that sucked. I was like, well, there's nothing like this. But now on this rewatch, I guess because maybe just I knew what I was in for and I knew what Martin Short was doing, I was more prepared for that. I, I vibed with it in a very different way, but also have four years, like has the world become so like, like off Clifford kilter as well? Right, that that you're sort of like Clifford's chaos. You're like, yeah, I mean, dude, you know, come on. Fuck Charles Grodin. This guy, what, he wants to like be good at his job? Like, come on. Who cares about that anymore, right? Like, is that is that one reason that maybe my I sided with Clifford a little more on, on this rewatch? I don't know. I got to say, David, uh, Clifford hasn't changed. <laughs> right, he's always, he's always been there. David has changed. David's changed. You're a father now. I mean, that might be part of it, David. I was trying to reckon with that because th- this is not a movie that would make you right. You shouldn't want to have children after seeing Clifford. This is uh, not a. I don't know. I think I would really? want. Yeah, I would want to have a kid like Clifford. He seems fun. Well, Ben wants a Clifford. If you're cool with Clifford, Clifford's going to be cool with you. You just don't <laughs> lie to him. Yeah, don't don't break <laughs> promises. That's all. Look at his family. Richard Kind is an uptight douche and his mom is drunk the whole yes. time like when they're on the plane in the beginning this kid's in a horrible has a horrible home life maybe the mom drinks because of clifford well that right <laughs> it's 10 years of clifford that's what i imagine is going on there right they're they're 10 years in with clifford and they just can't do it anymore but but david you're saying like watching clifford doesn't make you want to have a child in your opinion but does having a child make you want to enjoy clifford and even though you're dealing with an infant now you are you very quickly gotten into a more beleaguered dad state i I'm i think beleaguered. as your friend yeah. you are beleaguered you're we went to dinner the other night with uh, okay. uh, friends of ours who have children and you were complaining about the sleep and the staying up I wasn't and complaining. the cry- I was, not, not, right, not I in was, a crabby was, way but right just trying to talk it out because but I, i'm I saying right, yeah. does this movie now work for you as like a comedic exaggeration yes i do th- maybe that's part of it too where or, or, where i sympathize more with Cliff, like where i'm like yeah that's what you know groden is so flabbergasted by this this evil creature that's been unleashed on him. And I'm like, well, you know, you got to roll with it, Grodin. Like, I, th- I think maybe that's one way in which my my loyalties shifted, where I'm like, yeah, you know, having a kid is very chaotic. That's okay. He is using Clifford. Don't forget right, that. Right, right. He yes. has no interest in Clifford. He's using Clifford. And it, it all starts, the problem starts is when they're back at home and Clifford is watching television and charles groden says let's shut the tv off it's time for bed at two in the morning (laughs) it it is at two in the morning (laughs) he's watching like a national geographic special (laughs) he's watching (laughs) he's watching nudity basically (laughs) on a national geographic (laughs) program and but clifford to be fair he says he's very transparent he says i don't sleep as much as one might think (laughs) 
<laughs> it's a little he's vague. Because he's up at five in the morning eating. Like just pure sugar. <laughs> yes. Just just to recap the plot of Clifford for anyone who has not watched the movie either time we've covered it on this podcast. Yeah. He's a, he's and we, a and we should say stinker. we should say at the moment that this episode's coming out, it is on HBO Max. And not only is it on HBO Max, it is on HBO Max as part of like a curated Turner Classic Movies Festival. Yeah, as it that includes be. a Martin Short tribute. So HBO Max also has like a half hour sit down interview with Ben Mankiewicz and Martin Short uh, talk about this movie in part. But the thing I really appreciate is before you watch this movie on HBO Max, there's like a five minute Dave Carger introduction. There's like a modern version of a Robert Osborne shot in son of some virtual background where he is like giving you, I, I would say, I think does a good job giving you a, a sort of framing context for this movie. What, we're talking about what just, you know, it sat on the shelf. It's sort of unusual development, right? things like that. But also, I, I think a proper context through which to view this movie. It's not that people don't know this, but I think it's the way you have to go into this because you're like, well, Martin Short was a sketch comedian, right? He was like one of the best sketch actors who ever lived. And then he transitioned to movies and he found a way to turn his sort of like disingenuous, smug, uh, you know, kind of show busy type into different parts and movies but as tom said it would it would get kind of like slivered right he'd play one yeah. slice of what he used to be able to play in one character on sctv where he played these very dense sort of specific but multifaceted characters where there are four or five games going on inside of them at the same time and carter was like you have to view this as an extension of his sketch work you have to view this as the kind of thing where if this happened in the context of a sketch, you would not question it. You would not be unnerved by the fact that an adult is playing a boy with a wig and a double shaved face because you're used to seeing that happen. But something changes when it, it's framed in a movie where people just get like upset and unnerved. I, f I feel like there's an aspect to audiences where there are certain movies that people flag because they think they no better than the movie and it's like, yeah. like cabin boy is a movie that people go oh that's dumb but it's this movies people say are dumb all the time but there's certain ones that they say that's dumb and i'm smarter than that not realizing the people that made it know how dumb it is and they're smarter than you'll ever be and they're embracing stupid stuff and having fun with stupid stuff but there's a but that's that kind of there's that next level of vitriol that you get from certain from the public with a thing when they feel that they've been insulted by something. Well, well this is another aspect, Tom, it, it, you know, one of the reasons you want to do this episode is you felt like we were not, uh, we did not fully grapple with Clifford in the correct way in our first episode. Ben, obviously very effusive on the movie, David pretty revolts by the movie. I was somewhere in the middle in the four years since then, we have covered a handful of other comedies that I feel had similar reputations where they were not just flops, but they were like hated, made people angry. Like Ishtar is another key one, obviously, but right. we also did uh, uh, Lucky Numbers, the Efron movie, which falls into the, uh, the Adam Resnick uh, catalog with Cabin Boy and Death to Smoochie, where people are like, fuck this, absolutely not. Please stop it. I work uh, on lucky numbers to a very tiny degree. Uh, uh, please do share. Because I was working with someone who did a rewrite on lucky numbers and I was their assistant at that point. And I pitched ideas for trying to solve what they saw as plot problems. Um, and I pitched one thing that did get filmed, but did not make it into the into the movie. Uh, I think it might be on a bonus thing, like a dream sequence where he's hanging, where John Travolta is with um, like a game show host visits him when he's in, in a dream state. So like that was something I pitched and I think it did get filmed, but it did not make the final cut. And I do know Adam's original script for Lucky Numbers was very gritty and very... Uh, crime, just straight up crime, uh, funny crime stuff, kind like of in the, in the Elmore, right. Elmore Leonard uh, right. spirit of that, 
like and he uh his movie kind of got effernized uh and that was not the movie he saw he saw a very just a very down and dirty realistic un unglamorous uh telling of that story I mean, that makes, I mean, we, we talked about this with Efron where she was always, it felt like she was often drawn to very dark material, but would struggle to reconcile that with her, right. With her storytelling style. But like Mm -hmm. Griffin, all the movies you're talking about, Ishtar, especially this movie, just like what it's what Tom, Tom's absolutely right. People think they're like that. The movie, they're smarter than the movie or whatever. Like they're, they're smarter than the filmmakers or something like, you know, where it's like, well, I can see what a disaster this is and they messed it up. And I mean, in criticism, I think that is like the ultimate mistake you can make is think that you're thinking that you're smarter than the thing you just saw, because then you're not a critic anymore. You're like, you know, you're like an executive. You're like giving notes or whatever. And like, you know, like I feel like you can get lost in instead of criticizing the art, you're you're criticizing the process of making the art. And like, you know, anyway, this is, I guess, a classic example of that. But then there's just also the that it's creepy. But it, it that's good. I mean, the creepiness yeah. is good. I, I don't. Yeah. It's a horror movie. My, it's horror it's a horror movie. movie. It's, it's a psychological it's, thriller. It's, it's an intense thriller, and and it's and it's an intense. I mean, Ben, what was the thing you texted us today? Where it's like basic. It, it sort of starts fairly gently. Obviously, it has the the sort of bizarre future opening presented as a story as kind of a fairy tale also bizarre opening credit sequence where you're seeing the almost like with these the illustrations, medieval tableaus right. right and this very sort of like uh whimsical music that still sounds a little haunted ben, ben what was the thing you said was it a sign or i can't remember exactly where, where it's oh. like suddenly you realize like you start to sweat you realize yeah. like oh no yeah like the pressure is on the horror is about to begin it's when you see him sleeping and he's made the sign i love uncle martin you know that is the beginning <laughs> yeah. of him having a nervous breakdown that yes. is the point at which that begins but to your point, Tom, that's sort of like the moment where you could argue Clifford is calling his bluff, right? Like, as you point out, and a thing that I think makes this movie very unique and a reason people uh, uh, find it so unpleasant is I, I was thinking as two counterpoints, right? Of like, it, just within the Grodin filmography, and we obviously covered so much Grodin uh, this year with uh, Elaine May, but. Um, you look at Midnight Run on one side of this movie and Beethoven on the other side of this movie, right? Mm-hmm. And it, these movies that are like a, a menacing, a, a character menacing a beleaguered man, right? Yeah. And Midnight Run, he's the dilemma. And in Beethoven, he's the straight man. And Groden, innately sardonic right innately just sort of like a curdled man um midnight run gives him like a soul like the 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 key to that movie is the more time you spend with him the more you sort of start to understand the humanity of this guy he's not just a nuisance there is kind of uh, an ethos to him uh beethoven you're going full not full uh, Groden Grouch. As you said, Tom, they're sort of cutting it and putting it in a family-friendly box. But it also helps that Beethoven is an innocent, right? Beethoven knows not what he does. He is a dog. Yeah. This is just his behavior. You can kind of root for Beethoven and <laughs> laugh at the fact that Beethoven is making Groden go crazy. Uh, and then you think of other movies of this ilk, like What About Bob and what have you. It's like these formulas are usually either if... If the menace is truly evil, the straight man has to be likable. Or if the straight man is really bitter, like Steve Martin in Planes, Trains, what have you, then the menace has to have a good heart. And Clifford is like, what if a man who has chosen to be cynical comes face to face with, with an elemental chaos? Because you you also don't see, like, I, I was thinking of, like, Man of the House and Getting Even with Dad and that run of movies that come a little after this. Problem Child. There's Great a movie. little bit of an element where you see the kids, like, planning their attacks, right? Well, that's the thing. Those those are part of the 
kid liberation of the yes. 90s where suddenly that we're being directly marketed to on our cartoons and our comic books and it's kind of like hey kid don't you want to have long blonde hair and torment a sitcom star who can't book an oscar e movie anymore like grodin right. doesn't really count for like but dancing or whatever it's like don't you want to see this kid just put dancing through the ringer for 90 minutes like that's what we're like now we're kids we 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 slime people we you know parents we're the suck boss. homework parents is the suck. worst boogers are cool right they're about a certain kind of agency and objective that they're trying to to follow through on yeah yeah and there really is i think it comes down to ultimately if you like the scene in any movie when a kid kicks an adult, <laughs> then you might like this might be for you. If you if those scenes make you uncomfortable where you're just like, why that kid kick? I've always loved when a kid just hauls off and kicks an adult <laughs> in something has it never ceases to be funny to me. The idea of a kid just because the kid can just get. That low, that low to the ground <laughs> momentum right. to kick an adult where they sort of are not ready, energy. like just like the right. shin, like the idea of like a shin <laughs> is such a vulnerable spot. You're not protecting your shins. You're usually protecting your like your crotch is where you're just like, oh, I don't want to get <laughs> hit or kicked there. And then a kid just gets you where you don't even think about it. It's like devil's backbone when it's like <laughs> let's stab somebody in the armpit. Where it just you're just like, yeah, that I never thought about getting stabbed in the armpit. That would be the worst thing that could ever happen. But there is that thing when a kid gets strength and power over an adult, and I've always found it funny, and it will always be satisfying to me. And watching Martin Short, because like you said, uh, Griffin, he is an elemental force. Charles Gordon does is has yet to realize the extent of what he's up against because then he would have been like, you know what? I'm going to just hire someone to take you to dinosaur world. <laughs> I right. got to work on the plans for the scene. Why didn't he do that? Why didn't he right. say we can solve this? I'll find somebody to take you to dinosaur world. Cause Clifford didn't care who took him to dinosaur world. He wanted to go to dinosaur world. Bring my bring. Ah, uh, the phone's ringing. Okay. Ah, the phone. David, I cannot wait to hear. So, you know, sometimes these people who call us in the middle of podcast recordings, they can be some real characters, I've found. Man, sometimes famous celebrities, dead people, fictional yeah. characters. I should pick up the phone, though, which hasn't rung again, but I assume it's still ringing. Bring my bring. Click. <laughs> hello. Hey, hello. Uh, hello. Who's this? Uh, it's Danny Zuko. Danny Zuko from Greece, the the protagonist of Greece. Danny Zuko from Greece. Ow, 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 yeah. You're, of course, uh, I believe, the founder of the legendary T-Birds. Absolutely. The gang. Yeah. Right, El High. Yeah. Dean, okay. Dean Emeritus is the title I like to own. Ow. Oh, sure, because like, like, maybe you've pat moved on, but you, you still, you know. Well, cause some Still people view us friend. as a gang. I think of us as a school of hard knocks. Ow. So what's up, Danny Zuko? I got a problem, David. Uh, what's your problem? It's those summer nights. Uh, so you're you're singing your famous song uh, about summer nights. It's summer again, and the days I can get through, but the nights. So. Uh, they're too warm. Is that the they're problem? They're too hot, David. They're too hot to sleep. Me and Sandy, me and Sandy, we can't sleep. Well, and I'm using Danny. sleep in a euphemistic way. Uh, sure. Well, let's not let's not work blue here, Danny. I'm yes, not listen. doing sleeping. Uh, yeah, right, but still, I'm greasing lightning. If you understand my drift, I understand that there's nothing more that needs to be said. And so, you know, the, what you need are some yeah. crisp sheets that breathe to keep you cool. Right? Hey, I'm cool. So, I'm cool. Ow. So you can say goodbye to those sweaty summer nights. Enter I, Brooklyn. Wait, I'm in. sorry. I I didn't catch that last word you said. Those sweaty summer what? Nights. I. It's like you're speaking too low. Can you go to a higher pitch? I. I don't recognize the word. Oh, nights. Okay. 
Because I've said to myself in the past, I love the fact that I've had the same few pairs of sheets since just after college and I never liked them, but I just totally keep washing them every week or two and putting them back on the bed like it's totally normal. Right. Psych! Yeah, no. <laughs> I never said that. Only an idiot would say that. Look, let me tell you a little about Brooklyn and Danny. They were started to create beautiful, high-quality home essentials that don't cost an arm and a leg. Wow. And people, it's been a success because they're working with the manufacturers directly. They're getting luxury available to you without the luxury level markups. You're getting an amazing array of products at a reasonable price. And what they've got now, man, is they've got, you know, exciting new sheets that are going to make your summer nights much more tolerable. Now, David, when you say they, it was pretty nonspecific. What are we talking about? A bunch of platonic friends on a boardroom together? Who's running this company? Well, I'm sure that there's a lot of people probably working in Brooklyn, but Rich and Vicky Fulop definitely did kick things off. Uh, oh, sounds know, hot. The team. They've got something for every comfort need. They've got new products and colors and patterns all the time. They've got buttery, soft, breathable sheets. They've got plush and absorbent towels. Butter. Robes. Robes. Comfy loungewear. Loungewear. I'm a big fan of their loungewear. And they're so confident in those core products. They come with a 365-day warranty. And fans are confident, too. They've gotten seventy over 75,000 five-star reviews and counting. 365 days. That's a straight year worth of summer nights. Look, I've, I've got Brooklyn and sheets. I've got a Brooklyn and comforter. I've got Brooklyn and bathrobe well now you're just bragging and it ain't even humble i i'm not humble but danny you should give yourself the comfort refresh you deserve and get it what? for less at brooklyn and uh you should go to brooklyn.com and use promo code blank jack to get 20 dollars off with a minimum purchase of 100 dollars. that's b-r-o-o-k-l-i-n-e-n.com enter promo code blank check for 20 dollars off with a minimum purchase of 100 dollars. brooklyn.com promo code blank check David, thank you so much. And can I say one last thing? What? David, that ad read you just did? Uh-huh. Was electrifying! <laughs> I can't wait to talk to you again sometime, Danny. Yeah, I think I could come back a lot. I think, I think you're going to come back. I think this one's working. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm coming back. Clifford is pure id. I do think you are correct that the key to reading this movie is recognizing that no one is dealing with Clifford appropriately, that everyone is always has their own agenda they're trying to push. They're not actually trying to meet him on his own level. You know, it, it, everyone who gets the wrath of Clifford is also to some degree trying to change Clifford. Yes, right. they keep tussling his hair. He says he doesn't like that. Right. They can't. They think they can control him. Clifford is like the weather. And th unlike <laughs> these other movies we're talking about, the Kid Liberation movies, I feel like those movies have scenes that are very didactic where, like, the kid goes like, huh, so my mom likes his hair. Will she mm -hmm. still want to date him if he doesn't have hair anymore? And then you see right. them like putting super glue on the inside of a hat. And then you see the hat and then you see them getting caught and apologizing. Like Clifford doesn't have those sort of internal machinations. Like he's like a shark and his only goal is to get to Dino Land, right? And anything that gets in his way, he will like find a way to weave around. But whereas Groden is like strategizing, you know, and getting things wrong. Clifford is just being Clifford. Yeah. And he does explain before certain scenes, he says like, cause he's like, well, we can't go to dinosaur world, but I'm, we're going to go to the dinner party for Sarah's uh, and her parents anniversary. And then he, he just says to Stefan, his plastic dinosaur, he just says, isn't it funny that, he doesn't have time to, to for a little boy's dream, but has time to go to dinner. Like the idea, like he's and he's that's fair. Yes, because he still is a ten year old, and but right. he just has this high level of processing. It's still a ten year old's brain that has this mutated, high high functioning adult sense of of justice and retribution. But with a 10 year old's like code, there is an odd integrity to Clifford in that he says exactly what he's thinking at every moment. 
-hmm. and does not understand the games that adults play (laughs) that obfuscate and complicate things. Yeah. One of the most troubling moments is when he goes, when he like he has a, he he steals a Walkman at the airport. That he says he a kindly priest gave it to him. He steals a Walkman so he can record, and he's like editing together a tape to make it sound like his uncle's calling in a bomb threat. And but while he's editing it, he says to Stefan, he goes, "Do you like Uncle Martin?" And he's like, "I did. I do too." Like. While he's destroying him, he says, like, (laughs) I like him. So so to you, Tom, this is sort of a cautionary tale type horror movie where it's like there was a way through this that Grodin does not identify. You know, like he could have gotten away with it. He could have, you know, shown off Clifford to his fiance and, you know, impress her Mm -hmm. and satisfied Clifford and Clifford and and get everything done for his bot. He could have done it, but because he has the, the ego to be like, well, this is just a kid. I can boss him around. Like I, you know, that's, that's his hubris. That's, that's what the movie is about. He's, he's, you know, he, that is his undoing. Many many a horror movie, you know, people think they can do act, they can open the tomb or whatever, and they'll get, you know, they'll be fine. That is the undoing of, of uncle Martin. Yes. That he, he thought he could just shove a little kid. He thought he could just that an adult's priorities take precedent over a kid's pri- priorities, but not to the degree that it's just like, well, no, I got to do this, the city planning and we'll figure your thing out. He's just like he's slamming the door on Clifford's dream saying like, hey, man, bad, bad news. I got to focus on this thing. We can't go to dinosaur world rather than find a solution to it. Right. Whereas like Beethoven or whatever, like the only mistake Grodin makes in Beethoven is his kids want a dog. The dog shows up, the puppy shows up on their front door and they're like, come on. And he's like, okay. I mean, I don't want a dog, but okay. That's his only mistake. So Beethoven is more, that's, that's just a metaphor for parenthood where it's like, look, it's just a nightmare. You're just gonna, there's always something. Yeah. There's always going to be something, but this is, it's a little it's it's like a fable or something. Like I guess that's why that opening credit sequence kind of makes sense. Like there's this fable element for everybody. We could have we could have figured this out. Now, do you feel like all the priest stuff that all feels like reshoot? It was. It that has was to all be, right. Yes. yes, right. So this movie was made it's by so Orion. Weird. <laughs> Orion goes under. It sits on a shelf for three years, mm-hmm. and this was all shot the the wraparound stuff in the future. With uh, uh, Priest Clifford mentoring uh, a young boy uh, played. This is Ben Savage, right? Yes, it's Ben yes. Savage. Uh, boy Meets World Savage. Uh, that was all shot like two, three full years later. I mm-hmm. think to try to at least to make it. Yeah, it is. It's a softening to just be like, oh, someday Clifford gains a conscience. There is funny material in this because Martin Short is funny. It is uh, very telling that Martin Short is like very beloved at the time this movie is made, and in the time that it sits on the shelf, like Father of the Pride, uh, Father of the Bride, not Father of the Pride, the DreamWorks uh, Siegfried and Roy sitcom, but Father of the Bride and Captain Ron and some other popular uh, Martin Short movies come out. So his like star only increases, arguably, right. at least as like a family comedy star. And uh, this is a movie that does not let you see Martin Short play his own age once. He's no. either upsettingly old man. <laughs> Comically old or frighteningly young, yes. Right. And there are parts when Clifford looks older than Uncle Martin. Yes, absolutely. In the movie. There are parts where you watch when when the lady swings the bag back to like hit Uncle Martin when she thinks her kid... God, that all, he paid him to take his clothes off in the gas station bathroom, which is maybe a joke that I don't know if anybody would run with right now. A a funny, funny misunderstanding moment of lady, I did not pay your child money to disrobe in a gas station <laughs> men's room. <laughs> like what a fun mis- uh, miscommunication. Um, it's like. She swings the handbag back and hits Clifford, and he like he looks like the adult 
like he looks like the 40 40 year old that he was at that point yes when he's getting whacked there's so there's so many odd things like that where he's either like you said he's 80 or he's 10 (laughs) (laughs) and he's obviously neither he's 40 which is also a there, do you do you feel that this movie makes sense if you think about the career of the previous generation of comedians like Jerry Lewis? Well, yes, yes, yeah, right. That that it is the only context in which it right. makes sense because uh, Jerry Lewis could have done this movie at the peak of his career, or rather, let's say a movie with this pitch. Right, mm-hmm. he plays a little boy who causes chaos for his uncle. And no one would have batted an eyelid if he did that in the fifties or sixties. That no, would have people fit would have in. loved it. Yes, they would have. They would have loved it too much. The French would have given it a Medal of Honor. Uh, it would have been lauded uh, up and down the boulevard. Um, I I do think at the moment this movie comes out, the uh, Rue. It would have been. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, uh, Don La Rue. <laughs> um, the moment this movie comes out, I don't think there's really that much of a context for this other than this is a thing I, I was kind of stewing on while rewatching it because also just talking about the movies of this ilk that we have covered or talked about adjacent to movies we've covered that had such an angry response comedies that had such an angry response. It's very odd that like uh Pee Wee's big adventure totally works. It's very odd that's the only movie I, I would argue of like the 80s, 90s into early 2000s that has this kind of vibe. And there are other movies we haven't covered on the podcast, but I feel like had similar anger. But Pee Wee's Big Adventure is set in Tim Burton's universe. Like it's not well, set in the real world. Right. You know, this is like, my point. My point is it's why so was, incredibly heightened. Yeah. Why? Just talking in, in terms of the court of public opinion. Why was Tim Burton able to pull this off and no one else was? Because I, I think Beetlejuice is a milder movie. It also falls into this where he was the one guy who figured out a way to package these types of premises, this type of chaos, this type of sort of surreal imagery into uh, a box that like uh, people liked that made them happy. I think part of what makes Pee Wee work is that by the, when that movie came out in what eighty five, he Paul Rubens never did anything other than being pe- like everybody. There was such a mystery around it. It was a, a closed call. circle. It was a sure. closed circle. Yes, and you were entering the. You didn't know Paul Rubens from other things, and now he's doing this character. He had fully created his own context for you to understand the movie. And he, when he promoted the movie, you watch. He went on. He would always only go on Letterman as Pee Wee and. Everything was him. It was like a self-contained world that you could enter and not feel like a movie star was playing this weird kid. You were, it was just Pee Wee was Pee Wee all the time. Right. To where it was like shocking when you'd see like Cheech and Chong movies and suddenly be like, oh, Paul Rubens is in this movie as a different character. That was like legitimately surprising to me. To see him that early doing other things. I mean, I knew he was not Pee Wee Herman. Like I, I like, but but it was still enough of a mystery that that uh, you could hand yourself over to that world completely. But I feel like the dinosaur world sequence in this has a real early Tim Burton vibe to it. And Cabin Boy is another analog is a movie that was written for Tim Burton. And then he decides to just produce instead. And I think Adam Resnick directs that movie very well and visually does a lot of the types of things you imagine Tim Burton would have done. And people were like, absolutely not. And David Letterman spent two fucking decades plus making fun of his own involvement in that movie. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's Letterman's. That's how Letterman was like emotionally processing. But like Griff, you say the dinosaur world thing is Burtony, but it comes at the end of a movie that is not always. That, that, it's not even a complaint for me that this movie isn't heightened enough because I think that adds to the tension and the horror of Clifford. But this is a movie about regular people. Like he is. He is. I mean, I guess Pee Wee has that a little bit. Pee Wee is odd 
right? You know, other people are less odd than Pee Wee. Pee Wee is a strange interloper. It's still a weird world, though. Pee Wee is a weird world, weird but it's a world. much weirder world, right? Right, and 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 so it all just like logic is just kind of out the window. Clifford, like Charles Grodin, has very mundane problems. He's trying to you know get a relationship nailed down and get a contract signed and get a you know get his butt like these are this is just any any movie goer is sort of like yeah i guess this guy's like a middle class guy who's trying to buy a house and shit and clifford is is like a genie that or what you know it's like he's he opened a bottle and this horrible like creature came out there's no amazing larry in clifford and and no. clifford doesn't right. start with like five minutes of Danny Elfman music over Rube Goldberg yeah. machines, all these things also, that just sort of like, Pee Wee right. Herman, he lost his bike. That's it. That's what happened. He lost his, someone stole his bike. He's got to get his bike. That's it. Uh, Clifford, you've got, you've got Clifford wants to go to dinosaur world. Sure. But also Grodin's got all this bullshit that is just regular human existence. You know, movie I feel like has a, a, a spiritual connection to Clifford that is uh, the cable guy. Yes. yes. In a lot of yes. ways. Yeah. Another right. Like we're like, who is this guy? Why is he behaving outside of society's norms? Right. Like right. Like yeah. Well, like you. You should not have touched this guy. Now he's in your life, and and, and that's like, that's a weirdly stylized comedy with a performance yeah. that is in an entirely different pitch than every other performance in the movie. Another thing that I think just kind of upsets people. Yeah, and ironically, Cable Guy. Uh, evokes a movie that Charles Grodin did early in his career, Rosemary's Baby. Yes. I feel. Yes. I feel that there's this strange connection between these three movies that that sense of just of just dread running under beneath real seemingly real life that the that there's horror yes, there. Right. There's demonic forces. Well and like the exact thing I like about Cable Guy is that Ben Stiller directs the shit out of it and treats it like it's like an Adrian Lyne movie or something. But I think that's another thing that threw people off about it. Like, that's that's another movie where people were angry when it came out. Not angry. just that it wasn't yes. like... Mm -hmm. I'm interested in this, sub, this subcategory of comedies that made people furious and also seemed to, like, unnerve them. Obviously, with Cable Guy, there was all the discourse about Carrie's paycheck. But also, wasn't it kind of just like, this is not the movie star I signed up for. I was all about Jim Carrey like when he emerged. like His movies were fun and madcap. And this is not like the Jim Carrey I've been promised. I want one Jim Carrey movie a year that is fun. Because it was at that point, it was Ace Ventura, Dumb and Dumber, and right. the, mask the Mask were yeah, right. everything that every... And then was... Did he do, was Batman right after Cable Guy? I, I think Batman. Batman's the same year, right? Yeah, I think Batman and Ace Ventura 2 are the same year, the year before Cable Guy. So that was like his whole oeuvre at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I forgot okay. Ace Ventura 2 is that quick. It is one year later. Right, right. right. But that, but that, no, but that is a good point because that's a, another thing is that like Carrie movies at that point in time were completely unconcerned with real world consequences, right? Like those are movies that all kind of met at the level and the energy of Carrie's performances. Everything was only taken as seriously as Carrie would take it. Whereas Cable Guy is like, here is like a Matthew Broderick movie that is being invaded by this other force. And the pitch of the movie is closer to Broderick and the Carrie element is like the disruptive force, much like Clifford, you could argue, where it's like this is maybe pitched for most of its running time more like a Charles Grodin movie that has this one sinister element. You keep saying sinister. I, th I like think Clifford is just like he's like inventive. He, he, you know, he is inventive. I looked up to Clifford. I was like, I, I should really try and up my game here. You've talked, Ben, about the fact that you feel like this movie is the closest you've ever come to seeing your relationship with your father represented on screen. <laughs> That's true. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's as, you're really, as a young boy, as like a preteen, yes. this was yeah. like you, yeah. you were very good at getting under your father's skin in a very particular way. Yeah, 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 for sure. Like trying to figure out some way to get my dad mad enough at the toy store that he would just buy me the thing I wanted, you Very know, clever. like, yeah, 
Yeah, so this movie was influential. And, I mean, I really feel like we've covered this, and it's just, it's like hearing it is really reinforcing it for me in that the movie's uh, perspective is like kind of from the adults, right? But really, if you look at it from Clifford's point of view, he's getting screwed around, and so he's standing up for himself, and sure, he calls in a fake bomb threat, you know, and he throws a party also, look, at his uncle's house, a rager. Okay. Sure, you, you some might be softening some of the edges on Clifford. I got to just say, he's, he, just look at his dynamic when he's on the plane with his family. Yeah, I was about assume, to say, he they almost know brings him down well. a plane. Right. They yes. know him well. He's, <laughs> right. he makes jokes to his father's face about him having a stroke. <laughs> <laughs> And he's just like, then, Daddy, the stroke is coming. Then you're gonna talk like this. Like he's, he's. That's the meanest thing you can say to somebody. You know, they cut in. The plane is one of the few times where they cut to old Clifford again. Do you think that's because they're like, Jesus, he's coming on so strong. We need to cut back to old Clifford to for him to say like, I think they. Yeah, I was, I was, I was kind of a jerk. Right, because right. he also will go down the aisle of the plane, holding his arms out like a plane, hitting strangers <laughs> in the head, just because he's not—he's not always a victim. He's a—he is a monster, but he's a monster sure. that you can placate if you just respect the monster. I think there are two independent truths going on in this movie, which is no one really listens to Clifford or tries to earnestly engage on his level. Also, he is a a figure of pure chaos. Yes. Right. Yes. Just because there's a way to satisfy Clifford doesn't mean that Clifford is a good kid. Clifford is definitely not a good kid. He's not. He's not misunderstood. Don't forget, Ben, that he looks out. When he's at the airport waiting for Uncle Martin to pick him up, he looks through the crack of the door and sees him before he does that whole I love my Uncle Martin routine. (laughs) It's the most calculate. You see him calculate that moment. Sure, of course. And, um, you know, at the same time, I don't know if any of us would have the ability to actually go through with getting a pilot to have to land a plane. I mean, that's impressive. Come on. Oh, it's very impressive. Yeah. Ben is just so overwhelmed by the scale of what Clifford is able to execute. Yeah. I mean, he's just operating at a high level. Like if I'm a shoplifter, he's a bank robber. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And the the part that makes Clifford scary to me is when you realize that he's he can do show tunes and he has full awareness of like adult (laughs) things that no child on the planet for him to just like trick his uncle to get on a train to San Francisco. And which we don't even know how he did that also, because we see him in the distance, but it's not like, I don't know. (laughs) Like it's a mastermind to get him to get on that train and leave So that he can go see, that his uncle can go see his fiance get hit on by Dabney Coleman. Like, (laughs) it's like he's, he's playing four dimensional chess. If anybody that gets thrown around now, Clifford truly was playing 4D chess. He, He was thinking several moves ahead. We should also point out this is before the internet. Okay. Yes. I mean, he he's doing this all analog. He's making Absolutely. calls. He's grabbing a phone book. He's figuring shit out. He's right. He's cutting up tape. He met a bunch of dumb teens <laughs> and told them, "You guys can party at, <laughs> at my my house." Like he's saying, "It's my house." If you take me to Dinosaur World tomorrow, the lack of process is good. The fact that we don't see so much of this only makes Clifford feel more powerful. You don't see the planning, but also that that you don't always understand the motivation of what he's doing. Like, you understand his objective is just to get to Dinosaur, to dinosaur world. world eventually, right? But something like the party, what does that do in the short term? Clifford is really, he's just kind of jazzing, you know? He's just kind of like feeling it out and going with the flow of of what he thinks cosmically should happen because you could argue some of it is like 
you know, uh, reciprocation for the fact that uh, Uncle Martin is not listening to him. But like a lot of these sort of like uh, uh, menace versus beleaguered man movies we're talking about. You know, there's there's a specific point for the embarrassment. It's a distraction. It's so they can get the upper hand, you know, Mm -hmm. something like him repeating the rug comment to Dabney Coleman does not help Clifford. It does not help his cause. Right. But he's playing by Bugs Bunny rules. He's playing by Bugs Bunny rules. Yes. Yes. Exactly. If if you cross me, I will use every tool in my toolbox. Right. To to hurt you. Right, tenfold. Like he's gonna unleash. There's no moderation from him either. Yeah, you started it. I finish it. It's it's symbolic. <laughs> it's symbolic because that does not help him get to dinosaur world any quicker. No. Lies we were talking about. It's literally like the the priority is take this guy down a peg. And for Clifford, that's irrelevant. It's just you've gotten in the way of the hurricane. Bring, bring, bring. Ah, once again, Griffin. Who could it be this time on the phone? I don't know. You never know. You can never predict. Last time it was Danny Zuko from Greece. It was Danny Zuko last last time, and I'm just dying to see who it's going to be this time. Please pick up that phone so I can hear that satisfying click, David. Click. Hello. Hello. H- hello. Who who's this? It's Danny Zuko again. <laughs> He's back. I got a new problem, David. So your summer nights, they're fine. You got the buttery They're cheese, solved. But the, what's... Summer days, the summer days are a problem now. Oh, no. The days. What's wrong with the days? The summer days. <laughs> what's wrong with your summer days? The post office. I don't want to waste my summer days in line at the post office. It can be a hassle. This summer yes. showing welcoming signs of a more normal life ahead. I can finally get back to enjoying my life's little pleasures like Sandy. But going to the post office, that ain't one of them. So you want to more go to like see a concert, get a get dinner with her. You don't want to go to the post office. Okay. No, okay. not even with Sandy. Not even with Sandy. But with stamps.com, you can skip strips to the post office and save on postage. You can mail and ship anytime, anywhere, right from where your computer. You can send letters, you can ship packages and pay a lot less with discounted rates from USPS and UPS. Now, Whoa. I see you have a computer, Danny. Absolutely not, but Kaniki okay. does. Kaniki does. Okay, good. Well, Stamps.com saves businesses thousands of hours and tons of money every year because they bring the same U.S. Postal and UPS shipping services right to your computer. And, you know, it's cheap, Danny. This is the other thing. They got deals you don't get anywhere else, like up to 40% off USPS, 66% off UPS shipping rates. And with their switch and save feature, you can quickly compare carriers to find the best rates every time. I like the sound of the cheap, you know, because I'm a fictional character from the 50s living in the 2020s and inflation is really getting me down. Of course. And also, you you know, you like to cut corners because you're, you know, you're, you know, Grease lightning. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, listen, Danny, stop wasting time going to the post office. Go to stamps.com instead. There's no risk. And with my promo code CHECK, you get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in CHECK. That's stamps.com, promo code CHECK. Stamps.com, never go to the post office again. Wow. Wow. Hey, and David? Yeah. The Avery you just did? Yeah. Was electrifying! Uh, thank you again. Here's a question. Could Clifford just get to Dinosaur World himself? He's so capable. He has so many tools in his toolbox. Why doesn't he just get to Dinosaur World by himself? Like, why does he absolutely need a chaperone? Yeah, he could steal a car, I'm pretty sure, right? Or this is I'm the a- thing. Like, can't he just do it himself? Look, to be fair, Uncle Martin has some pull at Dinosaur World he does, because yeah. he helped design the place. He would probably get a pretty sweet uh, right. sweet tour of Dinosaur World. But I don't know why he just doesn't say, Sarah, you seem to like Clifford. Clifford yes. definitely likes you. Would you <laughs> take her to, Would you take him to Dinosaur World today? It would help me out so much. I mean, that's kind of the codex of the movie is how well Clifford and Sarah get along. Is is the fact that Sarah seems to be the only person who isn't trying she to She kind of gets it. 
She mm-hmm. kind of gets it. She doesn't try to change it. She doesn't try to get in the way of it. She's she's sort of supportive of it because like it, it, uh, Kind and his wife just feel so past it. Right. And then, as we've said, Grodin is like using Clifford. Uh, he, he has a very cynical, transactional relationship to Clifford that he is not being honest with Clifford about. Uh, to a certain degree, he's not respecting Clifford's intelligence even enough to say, look, I just need you to act normal for five days. So my girlfriend says yes. Right. Yeah. Like in another movie, they would negotiate the yes. terms of that out. They'd be like, look, here's the deal. You want to go here. Right. I need a, I need a kid. So I look good. Let's shake on it. It would be very transactional. But that's sort of key to to the grim fairy tale nature of this is that Grodin is sort of done in by his hubris of not ever wanting to meet Clifford on his level and communicate directly about what he's looking for. And the Mason mm-hmm. moment, which is obviously one of the best line readings ever, is yeah. so key to that character because it's like here he is bullshitting five seconds after his marriage proposal you know this like pitch Mm -hmm. of a future life together isn't getting the response he wants here he is bullshitting and suddenly invoking a a nephew that he's never talked about before she calls him out on what's his name not even testing him but earnestly asking and he cannot even like confidently bluff like in his bluff he (laughs) has to admit that he doesn't really know. It's mm-hmm. I want to say Mason. Yeah. <laughs> you know he can't hey. even keep up the illusion that he cares about this kid for <laughs> one line. line is so fucking funny. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And he uh, he does and I mean I know it's obvious to say this but there are scenes that are just the it's like it's like a play. It really is like it's like a play. It's like the two of them when when he's just like saying i would he said his choice of words grown choice of words he says i was made to be naked or like i was made like like that the police strip searched him and this is because of clifford conceiving the idea that like i'm gonna have my uncle arrested in front of his future (laughs) in-laws like like what like it's it, it just like, but the way Groden plays it, he plays it like it's just hot. Like he believes all of it. He is so committed to the reality of the suffering with this. And it's just, I mean, that's what makes the whole thing. It builds to this, to this, these scenes between the two of them that are to me at the highest level of any comedy I've ever seen. <laughs> Yeah, my favorite moments are when it's it's Grodin and Short, and it's just them kind of like like one on one, and he's Grodin is just yelling at him. You know, like it, those are the funniest funniest mm-hmm. moments. Yeah, when he has the plastic dinosaur and he's explaining to him at the table, and then. Clifford can't help but put the make the dinosaur's head rest on Charles Grodin's forearm. <laughs> Just there's nothing to be like you said. There's nothing to be gained by that. Like he's finally <laughs> he's literally at the table negotiating with you right now, and you're irritating him while you're about to get a breakthrough, but he can't stop. Just prodding him, and it's it's like and then. To take the, the when he takes the um, the Tabasco sauce and pours it in for in his Bloody Mary, and but it just like exposes the hypocrisy of Uncle Martin to do some toast for for this this guy he that doesn't like him who he never really has met, and just to be like we love you. Well, he's he's such a disingenuous schmuck. Yeah. Even to the extent to go back to it, like how quickly he starts constructing a lie to try to seal the deal on a marriage proposal. Mm-hmm. You know, like this is the woman he loves that he wants to spend the yeah. rest of his life with. And for, she hesitates for a moment 
And he immediately goes to creating this fake narrative of him and a nephew. Everything this guy does is transactional, right? It's trying to talk his way into the outcome he wants, the relationship he wants with whoever he's face to face with at that moment. And Clifford is the first thing he has ever come face to face with that he cannot be reasoned, that he cannot reason with. Well, what if this movie, would people have a different feel for this movie if it was retitled Heartbreak Kid 2? I mean, I here's a, th- a genuine thought. Like, this is him grown up, and then he right. gets his comeuppance now by this other, f- like, he's the manipulator getting manipulated now. I, I even think if it was called Problem Child... Just because that's a movie that comes out around this same time. Then that's the dilemma. Right. It's there's a problem child. Yes. Right. Right. I also feel like it's to this movie's credit that it doesn't do this. But I feel like if the pitch was, oh, it's a parody of the omen. He's literally supposed to be like Satan and you give it some title like Devil Jr. or whatever. I, I, I think this movie, like for mainstream audiences, was lacking a very like obvious blunt hook in its title to explain how kind of like figuratively you need to interpret this kid. So this is my question. Martin Short as a movie star, generally his biggest hits, he's with other like three amigos or whatever, right? He's part of a trio. Obviously he does a lot of famous supporting roles. Is this his only movie where he is the title character? Uh, t- t- title character. I want to say yes. There's that other movie around this time that he was the lead in that I'm forgetting what is called. Which one? Um, what's it about? Pure Luck. Pure Luck's yes. the buddy comedy with no. Danny Glover. Danny Glover, where he's unlucky. <laughs> he was paired with so many things. Like Inner Space, right. he's paired. Right. Three Amigos, he's paired. Quaid, Captain right. Ron, he's paired. Right, cross my heart. The one with Annette O'Toole. That's like that's sort of like a rom com where they're like that's it's kind of like a farce to being his pure lead movie. Maybe that's what I was thinking of. Yeah, but like you're you're right. One of the only times where they're really selling you like Martin Short is X. Yes. Could America just not handle that? Like, is that part of like that? That as Tom was saying, like this is kind of the most pure Martin Short. Martin Short's star persona, like, you know, as a sketch actor and so on, like, in a movie, like, is it just too intense? Like, I mean, obviously there's like the Jiminy Glick movie or, you know, like there's things like that, but that doesn't, that doesn't really count the same way. That's not like a big movie. No, but I, I do think like, I, I feel like most people agree that Martin Short is one of the funniest people alive, right? You so rarely fun. meet people who go like, eh, I don't get it. I don't like it. Like he feels like a guy that crosses all kind of boundaries, but he needs to sort of be functioning as the counterpoint to something else, to like a relatable normal. I think part of it is maybe that like his fastball is this kind of like disingenuous schmoozy bullshitty kind of thing right like he's always playing with this level of arrogance i mean i was thinking because he and steve martin do so much stuff together right and still do to this day and steve martin started out as this very heightened kind of showbiz phony idiot character and then over the years was able to for better or worse evolve or devolve into playing like Mr. America, Mr. Dad, right. Mr. Straight Guy. He's the normal one. Everyone else is kind of like wacky, right? And he's the one who's rolling his eyes. Like he went from playing the jerk to being the guy who plays the guy that the jerk menaces. I don't think uh, Martin Short has that in his repertoire. Uh, I, I'm not even saying that uh, uh, he couldn't do it, but I think he is so disinterested in that. And I think even like from my limited experience working with him and everything, this is like how he operates at all times. I think nothing amuses him more than people uh, uh, arrogantly, uh, confidently, blithely hurting other people conversationally. His thing is so interesting because he is ultimately, I guess you categorize him as an entertainer. Mm -hmm. He's never been consumed with 
the thing is like, well, this is going to be the role that finally people take me seriously as an actor. Outside of a couple things here and there, he'll right. do uh, Inherent Vice or he'll do these things. But he was not going to win any awards with his role in Inherent Vice. It was just an insane injection of Martin Short yeah. into it. <clears throat> He's interested in entertaining people and using any any skill set he has that will make that the result he will use. The thing he does not have that Steve Martin ha- has or did not, maybe did not always have, because he was also an entertainer at one point where he was, he would do magic if that worked and he would play banjo if that made you have a good time or do stand up. But then at a point, Steve Martin became clearly interested in being serious and being an artist. Martin Short seemed like he has always been interested in being an entertainer. And I don't, it does not seem like that changed at any point. No, it also there's there's something so uh, uh, like vaudevillian about Martin Short. I mean, even just watching like uh, his his physical comedy in this, obviously his dancing, you know, but but even just the way he he takes hits and stuff and the bookends, the beginning end of the movie as the old man and all that sort of shit. It's like there's a certain degree i think especially with comedy stars where like these people pop because they're good in a sitcom or a tv show or supporting part in a movie where they get to just be the color right where they don't have to handle story weight they don't have to be an emotional anchor for anything they can just be pure funny and then whatever point people go maybe you're a leading man they start to like cut some of the edges off and simplify it and go like here's the normal guy version of your persona and then here are the couple moves we'll let you do on top of that steve you can still throw in a couple excuse me's but the rest of the time you're supposed to be this sort of like milk toast avatar of suburban dad and you could argue that as you said tom like he gets steve martin gets to a point where he gets more serious in his interests and then i think because of that movies for him literally just become a vehicle to make money to buy more paintings right yes. so he just does the calculation of like if i take these four things off of my persona i will be acceptable as a father in a movie and i'll take my 20 million dollars and go home and write my play and sit in my study and that's what i care about and and that's fine to me it's fine. i don't care but martin short even now into like his like near 70s is a guy who is like a vaudevillian who's like, I'm going to use every single thing in the trunk every time I go out there. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a maximalist in terms of I'll do anything to make them laugh. And I I think that works when you're putting someone in the third or fourth position in a movie and then any audience can go like, well, that guy's just funny. When you're asking the guy to kind of anchor the thing and carry it along, I think for some people it just turns them off because it's too much. Yeah, and he... It's very telling that when Martin Short reached a certain point in his career, what he did was create Jiminy Glick, where he was like, I'm going all the way back to where I started, which was with insane character work and and to just have an opportunity to do that and to just be a character repeatedly in shorter bursts and not just in movies that that made sense to him and that he also tried to talk show at one point like that that's where Jimmy yeah. Glick started was that 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 10 a.m. talk show he had which was trying to be him bringing his sensibility to a place that might be a a, a, a vehicle for it but turned out it I guess it wasn't he he has those he just likes doing that and it's clearly that's what drives him is making people laugh but also, like, Jiminy Glick had this Clifford energy where it's, like, yes. him sitting down with genuine, gigantic superstars and just trying to say the most harmful things to them, right? And also this sort of sweetness, the the weird kind of, like, what? Right. What? You know, which is so funny. He's acting like an innocent sycophant, but everything right. he says <laughs> is the most kind of, like, laser focus, like, sniper shot to their ego. Like, it was such specific hits to whatever that person person's complex would be um and and then he tried to do it as a movie and it like didn't work for people but something about primetime glick where it was just like that show is like criminally uh impossible to watch now yeah but i went down a rabbit hole a month or two ago of watching whatever clips i could find on youtube and they're just so 
goddamn good, but it's like, is that like the best format he will ever find is like just playing the biggest character with like the most accoutrements, you know, the most like ticks and everything. And just for six minutes, figuring out how to turn like every single word into a blade against these people. Okay. So wait, wait. we are calling this episode Clifford Two, Hyper, Hyper Clifford. Clifford. Yeah. And we're talking about Martin Short's career. What about if we right here, right now, try to like put into the world a sequel to Clifford, old Clifford. Right. I, look, I do want to throw out, I said uh, uh, near 70s. He is, in fact, 71. He looks incredible. He but, looks Ben, what, what you were asking is, what would we pitch for we're Clifford at, to star his 71-year-old Martin Short? Because we're at the halfway point. The, se- the future sequence in Clifford is 2050. Right? right? This movie was made at the start of the 90s. It's now the start of the 2020s. We're pretty much halfway into Clifford's life. So he doesn't have to be reformed. In 2020, if you if you made a movie set in this decade, maybe maybe it's a prison break movie. I mean, because I'm assuming he's going to end up in prison at one point. Although well, I guess I can now be spoiler 40? alert, he ends up a priest. Well, I understand yeah, that, right. but I'm still thinking <laughs> like he doesn't have to oh like uh, immediately be become a good kid. That is a fucking wild thing to think about, though, that the the amount of grotesque old age makeup on Martin Short at the beginning and end of this movie is to sell him being 70 years old, one year right. younger than he is current. And you see him now and he looks great. And he, he looks, looks like me. He looks like he's melting in um, in the movie. He looks like, yes. like a wax me figure came to life and is in the heat. Um yeah, it's a very interesting thing to think what the you want to know what the middle years are like. Yes. You want to so fill in the gaps. Right. Yeah. What is he like in college? You know, did he go to college? Like, does he become essentially a professional criminal? Did he become a professional criminal? All of these things. Maybe he steals dinosaur bones. You know what I mean? He's like, he get involved in like the black market of dino bones. Well, I guess the question is, like, knowing that the the priest wraparound was reshoots, done later, demanded by the studio, right, uh, to try to make this movie more palatable, is there is there a thought that you approach Clifford to and say, that's not canon? Like, the priest wraparounds are, are equivalent to the voiceover in Blade Runner. Well, let's get back to the purity of the original vision. Let's not accept that as Clifford's future. Yes. That's exactly what I'm saying. You can just cut that out and then we can, or I don't know, we'll do a, a, you know, uh, maybe it's like the spirit of Clifford affects somebody else, right? That's kind of fun. Like sort of a like body switch kind of thing. You sure, know? like it follows. So exactly, you want to kind exactly. of do like an it follows, yeah, with, yeah. but with <laughs> Clifford. Yeah, 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 yeah. His spirit possesses someone. Bring, bring, bring. Phone's ringing. Who could it be? I don't know. I have no idea. We don't know. So we'll, we'll find out. And here's how we're going to find out. Click. Hello. Danny Zuko again. Hello. Right. Danny hey, Zuko Danny, speaking. Danny. Danny, are you like lonely? <laughs> like, do you like, you really, do you have no one else to chat to? Yeah. Sandy's hanging out with a friend. I don't know how to spend time alone with my own thoughts. Um, so what's up, Danny? I, I've solved your summer nights and your summer days, so I don't know what the problem could be. I have a third problem. What's your third problem? It's my summer thighs. Uh-oh. What, have you put on a little weight maybe in the summer? Yeah, yeah, post panini. Come on, we all put on some panini weight, right? We did. Look, I mean, it's no problem, but you know, I do think after the after the panini, like you say, a lot of people are trying to maybe change their mindset, build some better habits, get a sustainable journey to better health. There's not a lot of give in my leather pants. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the thing. You really, you really uh, wear some restrictive clothing, so you can't really yeah. fluctuate too much. Right? No, okay. I sewed myself into these bad boys. Well, it can be overwhelming to find a way to feel healthier. You know, there's all this equipment and programs and supplements. The wellness industry is throwing all kinds of stuff at you. You don't need to take that all on, okay, Danny? No, that sounds like some beauty school stuff. Frenchie would know about that, but I don't know. Frenchie would know. But with Noom, 
you can take a path towards better health one step at a time. Their psychology-based approach helps you change your mindset rather than demanding a whole new lifestyle. Wow. Like the way that Sandy changed her mindset and started smoking cigarettes and wearing leather. Sure. And, and yeah, right. And loosened up. Yeah, exactly. Look, when you use Noom, it can help you better understand your cravings. You know what I mean? Mm. It can yeah. help you understand the physical and mental differences you've experienced. Like maybe you enjoy exercise instead of dreading it. I got a craving. You got a craving? What's that? Sandy! Right, yeah. No, you love Sandy. I mean, that's great. You seem like you have it all figured out, but... <laughs> Only now that you've been solving my problems. Yeah, well, Noom is going to put you in touch with a community and with a person who can help you with your goals, and it can help you learn about food, the psychology of eating, you know? It's a much more yeah. empathetic, flexible approach to, you know, logging your food and seeing your progress. You got to start building better habits for healthier long-term results and sign up for your trial at noom.com slash check. That's N-O-O-M dot com slash check. Noom.com slash check. Sign up for your trial today. That sounds great. By the way, what episode are you recording here? Uh, isn't this the Clifford episode? Oh, wow. This feels like an odd episode for me to come on so hard. <laughs> it, it is. It's true. I, but look, those summer days. Yeah, no, I mean, look, it was the summer nights. That was like a lob up, you know? My ears were burning. It was like something was calling out to me in the copy that you had been sent. But I also, I, I mean, I have to mention, I, I'm wondering right now if I kind of blew, blew it because, like, I felt like I had maybe, like, recurring ad read potential and then coming in three times in one episode, I might have worn out my welcome. It's going to be hard for you to find new angles, but you know what, Danny? You often surprise people. You're, you're, That's you're true. That's true, but it also might just be a three beats and I'll never see you again kind of deal for Danny Zuko. We'll find out. That's the mystery of the phone. Okay, bye. By the way, this ad read was electrifying. <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, I have a treat. I have a treat for, for uh, the three of you, especially you, Ben. Uh, oh, my God. This is... Oh, boy. A okay. garment bag? Oh, wait. Like a, no. A men's warehouse garment bag. This is not from men's warehouse. The garment bag has nothing to do with what's inside the garment bag. Wow. Wait. Okay. Is that Clifford's jacket? jacket? It's the dinner jacket. Yes. I, wow. I own, I own the, the suit. red dinner jacket. Wow. Wow. That he's wearing on the poster. He's wearing that on the poster, yes. right? I own it. I own the wow. entire that from that scene. I own the uh, his wardrobe for that scene, including how, the shoes. How, <laughs> how did you acquire this? Was this an auction situation? It was an auction. It was an auction okay. auction okay. situation, okay. and I got it. Uh, uh, Martin Short has seen it. And and verify that that was it. He said that's real. <laughs> wow! Wow! <laughs> wow! Yes. So, um, what, what is Martin Short's like? How does he feel about? Because obviously, it's like it's different for us and for these cult movies that develop. But like, obviously, the movie wasn't successful. Does he dwell on that, or is he just kind of like, no, it's good that it's found its following later? And like, I don't know what Martin Short's takeaway from Clifford is. He seems to be pleasantly surprised by it but also cannot indulge it past a point either because sure the reality is that it did not hit and sure. it did not go well career or like in a, in a in a box office way it went terribly so but i think he it seems like it might be a cold comfort to some degree but he's happy it's better than nothing I mean, he keeps working with Paul Flaherty after this, right? I think Paul Flaherty is the head writer on his, yeah, on his morning talk show, but then also uh, was one of the main writers on on Glick. Yes. Uh, it, it never felt like he kind of like distanced himself from the movie and sold it out in a way I feel like a lot of these guys, like comedians who have a big flop movie, are then first in line to shit on the movie. Like they're immediately well, the trying thing. to I mean, I know right, he's get not ahead the of it. cabin boy, but right, yeah. but where it's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm I'm self-aware about this. Right. 
Now, uh, I've always heard that with the Letterman thing and Cabin Boy that there was that, a, and I don't know if it's true or not, that there was a prerequisite that if you were going to host the Oscars, you had to be in, you had to have a presence in movies at some point sure. in your career because Letterman did not. He right. had been in zero movies. And Johnny Carson had like a couple small things pre Tonight Show that, that he did before he was the, just the straight up host of the Tonight Show. Right. Um, I wonder how true that is, that that's why Letterman did that, or if it was just a fun thing to throw a bone to Chris Elliott and Adam Resnick. I mean, that yeah, is Letterman's only performance as someone who is not David Letterman in a movie. Like when he's in like private parts or whatever, he's David Letterman. Like those are the only other in, I'm looking at his, uh, at his filmography now. Yeah. What if David Letterman just like showed up in a Noah Baumbach movie? It'd be amazing. Yeah, well, I mean, like, who is going to take that swing where they put him in the Albert Brooks role in Drive or whatever? You know, he's got his big right. beard now, right? You just make him play some kind of weird villain or some, or like a, you know, an old guy so, in prison so or something, you know, father. some weird thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, he, he absolutely it's all just about finding the right thing and getting him interested in it. Right. Well, Martin short in inherent vice, that's an incredible performance, but that is certainly, yes. you know, the movies like, like you said, to like come in and, and give us some energy, but like, it's also funny that no one, maybe Martin short has no interest in this, but no one's used Martin short that way either. Like the sort of the surprise dramatic performance. I, I wonder how much of that is people not thinking to ask him versus him not, valuing that over comedy do you know what i'm saying like he he yeah. wouldn't inherently prioritize that over something funny and i i, I just remember there's the video of uh, uh after the inherent vice screening at the new york film festival when someone like from the crowd during the q a says like martin short this isn't a question but just like we miss you where have right. you been? We and want more of you. Clapping. Right. Right. And people are like losing their mind. And then you look at his IMDb and it's like the guy never disappeared. No. You know, and even if you go off of IMDb and you look at things he was doing live or, you know, on stage or anything else and TV. I mean, it's the guy never stopped working. I feel like once a year or two, he does something that gets a little more mainstream attention and then people treat it like a Martin Short comeback. But there is mm -hmm. no comeback, and there was no fallow period, really. No, he's he's that's and that's what makes him an entertainer. To me. Yeah, yes, like the Mulaney sitcom had that hit, right? That's sort of his yes. Alec Baldwin in Thirty Rock type. But he you know, he hosted Emmy SNL winner, right. like a year right. before that, and people were like, "Martin Short, where has he been?" You know, when he does Maya and Marty, which is after Mulaney, people were like, "Martin Short, why hasn't he been doing a variety show this whole time?" You know what? I I haven't watched the morning show, but I forgot that he was like Emmy nominated oh, for that. He right. had some role in the morning show that was maybe, you know, he's playing like an old talk host or something. I don't and know, and so. he he played dramatic on damages as well. Did he not? I think he uh, did. Probably. Yes. Yeah. Th yes. 13 episodes of damages. Damages was was very into because dances and damages, too, you know, like they that damages was very into plucking the Good comic man. actor. Yeah. Yes. On a sadly unrelated note, I have to go back to work. Uh, yeah, I I was gonna ask, should we play the box office game, uh, Griffin? We already did it. That's our only uh, you know, other feature. Uh, I know it's time to wrap up. It's been four years. I mean, I feel like in lieu of a better idea, we we should uh, do the Tom, red dog you... one. It hasn't come out yet. Ben, well, no, but well, but there was an original like movie. What you want right? to do the box office game for Clifford's big movie? Yeah. Uh, I probably can pull that up, actually. Here, give me a second. <laughs> Tom, I have a stupid brain where I remember the box office for most weekends, mm -hmm. and David tries to quiz me on it. But because we've covered sure. this movie before, Ben is now suggesting mm -hmm. that we do the opening weekend of mm -hmm. Clifford's big movie. Yeah, it's called Clifford's Really Big Movie, and it came I'm out. Sorry, I forgot. Wow. That's a yeah. really uh, fucking great joke of a title. Because he's, he's a big really, he's dog. Big. He's really big. Well, he's not big. big. He's really big. Right, yeah. right, 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 right. It came out April 23rd. It came out a day before my 18th birthday, April 23rd, 2004. 
Congratulations. Uh, opened number 19 at the box okay. office, a million dollars. So it's not featuring at the top. But Griffin, can you tell me is, the number is one that, movie? Is that John is Ritter's that last credit? I don't know. That sounds like a depressing question that I don't want to know the answer that to. That comes out a year after Ritter dies. I think it but might he be. He had a lot of, you know, he like he would show up in movies after, you know, he had weirdly Bad like, Santa. remember he, yeah, you know, he pops up in a few things. I can't remember. Okay, it's uh, his second to last credit. He's in something called Stanley's Dinosaur Roundup, which is a Disney Channel original movie. All right. Well, thank God that that was his final credit. But in number one, Griffin, it's a it's a thriller, an R-rated crime thriller starring one of the great movie stars. Uh, it's a movie we'll cover on this podcast one day. It's from a big director, but a sort of a vulgar tour type director. Vulgar a director he works with a lot. Great movie star. The star works with that director a lot. A lot. A lot. Um, it's like a revenge movie, thriller. kind of. Like a rampage movie. It's like, yeah, he's this guy is going to go crazy. Oh, oh, it's Man on Fire. It's Denzel Washington and Man on Fire. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, which is like a, two hours and two and a half hours long. That you had more time. <laughs> takes two of the longest pauses in film history in that one line. <laughs> Number two at the box office, Griffin, was a comedy. Uh, that I feel like has a bit of a cult following now. It's an absolute ripoff of an of a, a age old concept, gender swapped. Thirteen going on thirty. It's thirteen going on thirty. Jennifer. Yeah. I feel like people like that movie now. Like people it was sort of kind of came and went at the time, and now it has this cult following. Well, it was it's like cute. everyone thought that was the movie that would make Jennifer Garner Julia Roberts, and then it didn't happen. I mean, it didn't do terribly. It did okay. It's opening no, number but two, I, I just $21 million. No, but I people being right. like, get ready. Here's America's right. new sweetheart. We're all going to be doing They're fucking laps over there. Garner. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, number three, Griff, it's, uh, oh, it's a sequel to, in, to a two. It's a two part. It's part two of a two part movie. It's part two of a two part movie? Mm-hmm. You know, film this volume one, two. Release, it's Kill Bill 2. Yeah. The, the Tarantino movie I've only seen once. It's the only one I've only seen once. How do you feel about Kill Bill 2? I love it. Yeah, it's good. All right. I'm a big fan. Yeah. Number four at the box office in this bizarre weekend is a comic book movie, the kind that would never exist anymore. It's a Marvel comic book movie, rated R. Blade. Not Blade, but in that, in that realm. Punisher? More of us. It's The Punisher with Tom, Tom James Jane. The Punisher. Yeah. Why was it Blade? Just picture if Blade was running through the end game, right? He could have helped. <laughs> Hell he yeah. Helped. He's got he swords. Helped. He's got a sword. And the and Punisher the might Punisher. have been tough. He got guns. Like, no, he, he could have shot people. <laughs> Do you think like he'd have to have a seed where he's like, I, I'm into the, you know, Thanos has committed crimes, because right? Like he's got his weird code he's got to live by. They have to explain to him why <laughs> Thanos fits into it. He's right. like, did Thanos kill any wives? It's like, yeah, 50% of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can work with right. that. That and Punisher number movie five. is. Mm. Oh no, I was just gonna say that Punisher movie is garbage, and it's got like a Bad. weirdly stacked supporting cast. Where like Travolta, who but, else? But is also in like, it? isn't like Laura San Giacomo? Not uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, the one from Mulholland Drive. Uh, Samantha Mass is in it. Uh, Laura Herring is who you're talking right, about. Yes. Right, right, that's about it though. Ben Foster is in it apparently. I mean, that's a, that's a high class it's, for it's just, I mean, a like, Punisher just, movie. Tom Jane was just the tough beat for that one. That that's who they settled on to play the Punisher. Tom Jane does not feel like a Punisher. There's something inherently depressing about the fact that Travolta was doing that in 2004. It, it was right. like Roy Scheider is in it, plays the Punisher's dad, Will Patton. Okay, so comedian I'm wrong. John okay. Panette, comedian funny man, late great funny man John Panette. Yeah, you go now. You go now. You go now. He, he the guys at the buffet were really mad. You go now. He was starving. Um, is a is a Disney movie? Griffin is number five at the box office. Uh, oh, is it Home Disney on the Range? Animated film. It's Home on the Range, the cow movie. Rip. That's the end of Disney animation for five years. <laughs> right. The the movie that actually buried Disney. It's yeah. a, the, it is a snapshot of a different time. And the like Marvel is like putting out cheap R rated thrillers. You know, Disney is like a dead brand. 
uh, you know, the, the, this is April and the top movies are like a gross, uh, not gross, but really grisly crime thriller and like a body swap comedy. It just, you know, wouldn't be that way anymore. Yeah. Also, like Travolta doing Punisher was like a nail in his coffin rather than like, oh, look, Marvel's like bringing back like Marvel <laughs> is now Quentin Tarantino, where it's like, oh, it's taking like 70 actors, 70s actors off the shelf and giving them a career boost. Um, but that's it. So thank you, Ben, for suggesting that. We did not have to do the Clifford box office again. Clifford, of course, did terribly at the box office. But uh, we got to let Tom go. So let's, you know, let's wrap it up. Let's land the plane. Uh, Tom, any final thoughts you want to leave us with? Um, thank you for letting me pay my way onto your show. <laughs> I appreciate it. Next time, just come on. Next time, you know, I'll you'll just on. do a movie. I'll come on. I'll, okay, I'll yeah. say this. Tom, I have multiple times in the past told you that you open door policy. You were invited to come on. I would say, here's a list of things we're doing or say, is there anything else you want to do? And your response would always be something. The one I remember in particular is I would like to do an episode that is both movies called The Birth of a Nation. <laughs> the, the Nate yes. Parker and the D.W. Griffith. Right. Yeah. Clifford Just, was again. the first time you suggested something viable. <laughs> yes, that's fair. OK, I will be more. I will cast a wider net in the future. Okay. And I appreciate you having me on. Seriously, I do appreciate it. It's so much fun. Of course. Uh, you're a legend of, uh, of of podcasting and of uh, movie opinions and comedy and all of it. Um, and I appreciate all the support you gave uh, the George Lucas talk show last year. Uh, and 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 have given uh, this show over uh, the yes. years. You, you had been I will get the name the right. Show. I will get the name right going forward. I will not call it Black Chunk. <laughs> <laughs> um i will show some respect and get the name right but now i'm i it's i have fine. to go get yelled at now you have to go get yelled at uh it all ends it never ends it never ends well this ends this, this episode ends, ends. This but ends, it never yeah. ends is the book which is now available wherever you yes. buy books yes uh, thank you for having me on i i truly do appreciate it of course thank you so much um, yeah thank you tom yes. Okay, thanks. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Bye. Right. Bye. Okay, so now we start talking about Clifford the Bed Rag Dog, right? So the the thing is, All he's right, well, really, that's really the thing. He's big. He's huge. Huge. Okay, I, Griff. I haven't. I you know we should no, but I David. Haven't even no, no, but David. The trailer. But everyone he's was bagging red. on this trailer, right? That's the thing. They're, he's they're mad. Yeah, they're mad that it just kind of looks like a regular dog or something. What, what's the beef with the tree? It does look weird. I mean, look, I can't we deny need, it looks weird. David, we need a way to end this episode. Should we live watch the trailer? Yeah, I just right, threw it on. You want to watch it with me? Yeah, hold on, I think hold on. Should, All right. right. Okay, fine. Pe but, people got very excited thinking we were doing an episode on this movie. Well, you, you wanted to be in this movie. Is I mean, Are we allowed to talk about that? Yes. I, I mean, wanted obviously, to be in this it's movie a Walt very Becker. badly. Right. And Walt Becker falls into look, old dogs is to me what what Clifford is to Ben and Sharpling, arguably. Right. Yes. Uh, it's, it's your your sort of bizarre object your that you. Right. You know. Yeah. Right. And I, I have so many questions about Walt Becker as a man and how much he knows what he's doing. Um, and I tried very, very, very hard to get cast in this movie and thought I had gotten the part. They had sort of spoken to me as if I had gotten the part. They did the things that in Hollywood they do where they're like, please keep these dates open. Please right, don't right. get a haircut. We want to make sure that this is cleared and whatever. And then it turned out, I will not say what part because I don't want to embarrass yeah, anybody. I mean, I sure, 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 sure. I'll sure. tell you off mic and I, yeah, I'm yeah. sure. You've told me before. I just forgot. It was like it was like a good one scene or two scene part, right? And I think there are a lot of comedic actors who have roles like this in this movie, like kind of ringers coming in for one scene or two scenes. Yeah. I'm seeing like Russell Peters, Horatio Sands, Tony Hale, a lot of these big guys. Look, yeah. I, the audition waiting room I went to was stacked. It really felt like it brought everyone in. It's got a very overqualified cast. I really felt like I killed this audition, really wanted to do it. They kind of said, like, we have a pin in you. Please don't book any other jobs, this and that. And then it turned out that an actor who is inarguably bigger than me, but is not a superstar, was their choice, but was right. absolutely adamant that he would not do the movie unless they gave him billing in the opening credits. Oh, wow. And okay. it was one of those things where I was like, I will pay you 
to let me be in this movie. You don't have to put me in the credits, period. And they just kept holding out with this guy until the last second. And then I think either they folded or his agents folded or whatever. And I was a negotiating tactic. I wish I was in it. That having been said, let's watch the trailer for Clifford. All right. Yes. So okay. let's count it down so okay, people okay. at home can sink. All right. Okay. Not the and teaser, the trailer. The trailer, the official trailer. The teaser was just CGI Clifford, right? Yeah. Okay. And we will begin watching the trailer for Clifford the Big Red Dog. We're watching on the Paramount Pictures page. You should yep. watch there. There's no chuffa at the beginning. Okay. In three, two, one. Mason. Bark, bark, bark. I mean, I believe it. Is that Cleese? Oh, yes. Cleese is narrating, John Cleese. Right, and you have this sort of like Planet Earth, Koyana Scotsy style, slow motion, New <laughs> right. Yorker footage. <laughs> right. Okay, I think Cleese so is on a pet camera store. in this movie as well, in addition to being oh, yeah, the narrator. He's in this movie. He's yeah. in this movie. Right. Wait, who's this? I mean, who's playing Uncle This Casey is Jack here? Whitehall. Okay. David, this is Jack yeah. Whitehall, British comedian, star of his own sitcom. Now Hollywood is trying to make him a leading man. He also plays Emily Blunt's brother in Jungle Cruise, who is apparently the first openly gay character in a Disney movie. They keep saying that. Oh my God. Okay, wait. Should Our get tears the dog? made him big. Damn. Magical. And, now, and then he grows big overnight. Oh, so it's yes. basically it. just Beethoven. Yeah, because it's what Beethoven is—is is they get okay. a puppy and but then he this gets is big. hilarious. Because there's the thing—he's no, he's huge, guys. Look how big he is. I mean, look. Here's my first complaint about this movie: it takes place in New York City. This uh -huh. premise doesn't work in New York City. There is no space big enough for this dog, right? Well, but that's the, uh, you know, but that's the whole. Isn't the whole? Oh, Keenan. Uh, the whole thing is like. Uh, he not... broke the weight because he's so heavy, guys. He, These are jokes. It's Come on, big dog, big city. It's like you know, yeah. like we all know Clifford lives in an anonymous suburban town. But what if you know, for the movie, we level up? Why is someone in a in a ball? Oh well, you know, people do that. That's They're a... working out. Yeah, it's an exercise. I don't know. I, I feel like it's a thing. This just looks like shit. This, and he's not big enough. Oh, he just ate a dog. <laughs> okay, that was that's that's the wallpaper hey, touch. That was good. Now, when the when the first teaser came out, people were complaining about the color of Clifford, right? That he right, was sort, sort of, of like muddy red, desaturated. Yeah. And now I feel like he's he's more saturated, but it's a dark red. It's like a blood red. You know, but I feel like Clifford in this movie appears to be like maybe the size of a. SUV or whatever. He's not big enough. How fucking the, big do you want him to be, David? He's supposed to be like the child you, you, I don't know, is like riding on him and is barely noticeable. Like, he's supposed to be huge. Well, this is the, just the first movie. They have to go somewhere in the sequels. He's maybe still a puppy. I'm with David. I think they fucked up. They fucked up big time. I mean, here are a couple things I want to say about it. Mm -hmm. One, I understand what you're saying, David, that the premise is Clifford, big dog, big city, right? As I remember it from the original Clifford book, and perhaps I am wrong, but it, my memory is that they live in the city, and then once he gets so big, they move to the suburbs because they can't fit him in anymore, right? Where this trailer loses me in credibility is the moment that they wake up and he's suddenly big and he hasn't destroyed their entire New York City apartment, that the ceilings are high enough to fit him, that he can walk from room to room, that they live you know, in like you know this how fucking hard it is like, to get palatial... an apartment in New York. I mean, with high ceilings, no less. Come on. I think the only place in New York City that Clifford could fit into is Jeffrey Epstein's mansion. And I'm sorry for okay, invoking well, it, but it really does feel like that's the I, only I space big enough for him. And I watch this movie, this trailer, and I see that Clifford is fitting under the roof. And I ask, how did they afford this place? Where did they work? And what did they know? You know, you don't make this kind of money, honestly, to have a Clifford-sized apartment. Um, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, I my problem is that that movie looks boring. I just the nothing interesting happened except Clifford was running around. Except right at the end, he ate a dog, so that was sort of interesting. He spat the dog out, but still, little tension there. Now let me That's say this: it. I hope this isn't breaking any NDA. I forget that I signed fucking four years ago or whatever. From my memory, 
of the audition sides that I read, the conflict of this movie is that geneticists want to use Clifford yes. to grow to other animals, animals to yes. be this size to solve world hunger. That's part of the log line for this movie. So it's definitely they're they're leading with that. That there's like an Okja element to this where where yes. the girl doesn't want Clifford to be turned into food. Uh, I think correct. that's what Tony or Hale maybe not is food, playing. But he does, not, doesn't want to be like a science experiment or whatever. Right. I think Tony Hale might be the villain. She doesn't want Clifford to be fed to the gaping maw of capitalism. Okay, whatever. No, I'm not. I know. No, I'm not going to truck with this. What? You, you fucked up. I don't care. Don't try and sell me on. Oh, well, Clifford, you know, yeah, it's about. No, it's not. You should have just had a big red dog who causes trouble for 90 minutes and then got out of there. You know, honestly, doesn't Beethoven have a science uh, part? Like someone wants to kidnap Beethoven too, right? I'm trying to remember. He's like, well, w- wait a second. They want to ca- They want to capture Beethoven too, comma T O O, or they want to capture oh, Beethoven sh- second. No, no, no. That was really great. Thank hold, you. hold, hold, hold. Uh, David, hold. Thank you. I guess for applause. David, and David, hold. David, hold. Oh, no, David I mean hold. they're still going. They're. I mean that was a standing O, right there. Thank I have you. to go. I have to go. I think the what fear maybe in say? Beethoven they're just trying to euthanize him. I w- I just remember at Beethoven at the end he's like captured by a vet and they have to free Beethoven. It's a drool uh, scientist th- actually. But I think it's just like kind of a classic dog catcher thing. Like I don't think they want to do like a science experiment on Beethoven. So do Clifford you- has more energy. What what? Do you know that Rosie Perez and David Allen Greer are in this movie? I believe David Allen Greer is the voice of Clifford the Big Red Dog. Wow. Um, I what? can't speak to Rosie. That David Allen Greer is the vocal effects for Clifford is how he is credited. Why? I Clifford don't talks. I don't, I don't think so. I think he just barks. Uh, <laughs> no, like in the in the books he didn't talk, and then they did the fucking cartoon show that turned into Clifford's really big movie, and that was John Ritter as Clifford could talk, but only to other dogs. Cool. Uh-huh. Sure. Right. Right. Love to be a fly on that wall. You know what I mean. I don't know what you mean at all. Hear dogs talk to each other, especially a big dog talking to a small dog. Like, I mean, what would it be like? That's a podcast right there. Big big dog, small dog. All right, Griffin, end the episode now. I'm begging you. I don't know. (laughs) I have some more Clifford questions. No, end end the episode. (laughs) It's over. I got to go. Siobhan Fallon's in it? Yeah, she's great. When, when Paul Rodriguez she... plays Alonzo, a bodega owner. Sounds good. Love Paul Rodriguez. All right, yeah. I'll close it out. Um, so Thank this you. has been Blank Check with Griffin and David. Um, oh, I forgot all of it. So actually, no, Griffin has to do it. Or I'll David, you it. can do it maybe. I Thank don't know. Thank you all for listening. Sure. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Thank you to Marie Barty for our social Boom. media. Joe Bowen and Pat Rounds for our artwork. Thank you to Lee Montgomery and the Great American Novel for our theme song no research was done for this episode whatsoever (laughs) true you can go to blankies.red.com for some real nerdy shit and go to our shopify page for some real nerdy merch next week are we getting old not yet next week is space jam yep a movie that david is going to be you're, I mean, look, if David, I know it was frustrating for you to have to talk through these logic questions of Clifford at the end of this episode. So it must be a relief to know that next week will be a warm bath of you just watching a very comforting, honestly made. Yeah, right. Straightforward. <laughs> no notes. No one had any notes on this movie. Space I'll Jam and New Legacy. Yes. Well, you'll say what? I went to my local comic book store the other day. Sure. DC recently published a space jam graphic novel adaptation which i believe is sums up the plot of the movie right or at least some of it yeah i leafed through that i have a lot of questions great cool i did i did like a flip book just to try to get a sense of some of the things that are happening and i'm more confused now but that's what we're doing next week my brother jamesy newman's triumphant return to the podcast space jam 2 a new legacy week after that old week after that we're talking dark star uh going into john carpenter um that's all we need to say uh stay tuned for uh clifford three tomb of the dragon emperor which i think we currently have scheduled for 
2025. Um, and as always, I want to say Maisie.